There's a saying in Tibetan Buddhism that tragedy should be utilized as a source of strength. Oh, if only it were that easy, hey? Time once again, my dear friends, to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. So, I'm a guy in his early 30s with a four-year degree and a poor temperament. And there isn't much in the way of career options out there for someone like me, but I do what I do to get by. I live alone in a month-to-month -month studio apartment with a communal bathroom that everybody who lives on my floor uses. Yeah, great. And I embrace the new uh, gig economy as soon as it started in my area. I use an old smartphone to download apps that are work-related, but it does the trick for now. I hunt for jobs on Craigslist every day when I have a few minutes of downtime. Eat like crap, sleep like crap, and what few romantic prospects I've ever had in my life were few and far between a very long time ago. Well, I've worked at two or three jobs, can't quite remember my field of choice, for a grand total of two years. The longest job I've ever had beyond that was as a pizza guy for three miserable years. I've seen some strange things in my time as a delivery boy. I walked up to a door, answered by a naked person, or sometimes naked people. I've nearly been mugged a few times driving around Wilmington. Hell, there was even a time I talked a guy out of suicide. Oh, he was a good tipper. But all of those things pale in comparison to the last gig job I took. Well, it wasn't so much the job, but the last delivery that I ever made for it. I've been hired by a baggage courier service in Philadelphia. They put out a Craigslist ad, and I managed to email a resume to them from my phone. They worked out of Essington, PA, right outside the town of Chester, Philadelphia International Airport, and the Delaware River. Well, the pay seemed good. Not great, but the hours were good. I worked second shift, 2 to 10 p.m., which allowed me to get some sleep after my paper route. The job involved driving a crappy white Ford Econoline van to the airport and stop at each baggage office at each terminal. Once there, we went to each airline's lost baggage office to grab what hadn't made it off the flight for whatever reason. After all of the lost bags were collected, we drove the van back to the shop and unloaded it, all based on routes in Jersey and the Philadelphia suburbs and Delaware. Even though I'm from Delaware, yes, it's a real state that exists, I never actually got to take the Delaware route. Often, I was relegated to Jersey. After the bags were sorted, we used a lost baggage app to cross-reference each bag to our own delivery code so that the passengers of the airline would know that we had their bag, that we were bringing it to them, and what our personal vehicles looked like. What the app didn't tell them, something that they never seemed to understand anyway, is that we often took 10 to 15 bags at a time, Thus their bag was part of a route, and everyone had a window of four to six hours to receive their bag. When I started the job, I figured that people would be grateful enough just to have their stuff back. But that was never the case. They gave me dirty looks. I received nasty phone calls from some of them, and they gave me every sob story under the sun. But I never received a single thank you, or a tip, or any form of gratitude. I had half a mind to say to these people, Oh, sorry, sir. I'm sorry, madam. This is my job and I do the best I can at it. I'm sorry that your Samsonite is one of the 15 bags I had. Oh, and I had to stop for gas as well. If that bag is worth less than your time, perhaps I could have chucked it into the Delaware River, thus ridding us both of this inherent pain in the ass suitcase. God, I hate people almost as much as I hate July. But this little tale of mine isn't about any of those ungrateful people. This is a story about the last bag I ever delivered. I'd only been with the company for about three weeks. Doing any form of manual labor in Philadelphia in July is humid death, and the sun stays out until about nine in the evening. But, well, this was the only job I could immediately find. Well, one particular day, I was getting ready to take the Jersey route, a total of eight bags that day, when I got called into the office by Heather, the owner of the company. She told me that Frontier has just received another bag and they begged us to take it. Where is it going? I asked her. Tom's River, she replied, cringing a little bit as she braced for my reaction. Oh, Tom's River was only about two hours from the courier office, that's all. Included with my other eight bags 
Oh, why would I be so angry about having to drive two hours out of my way? Oh, get the hell out of here, I immediately yelled back. It's a lot of money, she snapped back at me. You'll make $120 off this bag alone. I rubbed my chin and sighed, pacing in the office and thinking hard about the delivery. I must have given myself away because when I looked back at her, she had a slight quiver of a smile on her lips. Well, I guess I don't have much of a choice, I told her. I'll head back to the terminal. I don't get any ideas about making something like this a regular thing, by the way. This is a one-time-only favor that I'm doing for you. She scoffed. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that before, Richard. Anyway, when you get back to the office, I won't be here. I'll see you tomorrow. I took my own Camry to the terminal this time. I hated that damn van anyway, and it just made sense to drive my own car. I parked outside with the blinkers on in the pickup lane. I let the nearby parking authority and state police know who I was with, and ran inside to the frontier baggage claim. The woman behind the desk, Gina, was on the phone when I got there. Well, I'd met Gina before, and she smiled as I made my way to the desk. She held up a finger to me and said goodbye into the phone and hung up the receiver. And then she turned to me. Hey, Ricky, she said to me cheerfully. Oh, I'm glad you could make it. I just got off the phone with Heather. I ran my hand through my hair. Tom's River, Gina. Really? She threw her hands up. I'm sorry. They just send them to me and I call you guys. I told my supervisor how expensive this bag would be and he didn't care. So here we are. I know, I replied. Yeah, I'm sorry. Are there any special instructions with the bag? She sucked air through her teeth. It sounded so vile that I'll never forget it. Well, she started, but then trailed off. Gina, I replied sternly. Without saying a word, I darted to the corner of the office. I whipped round and stared for a moment, saw it in the corner, and then threw up my arms in disgust. The bag was this old blue leather jet flight brand piece of crap. Well, most of it was blue. It was yellowed in a few places, and some of the leather chipped off. It was from the 1950s, before rolling luggage was a thing, and this was just a handle suitcase. I turned back to look at Gina. I don't know, she said to me, apologetically. We ran it through the x-ray machine, and there's nothing but clothes in it. The name, address, and phone number are on the slip. That's the best I can do, Ricky. Sorry. I looked down at the suitcase and pulled the tag off. Pulled out my phone and caught the phone number on the suitcase tag. It rang twice and, I swear to God, it did the strangest thing afterward. There was a click on the other end, like someone had picked it up. But there wasn't any ambient noise in the background. No one said hello. No one breathed into the microphone. And I didn't hear any noises in the background. I didn't even hear the static of the landline itself. There was nothing. Well, I hung up and tried calling back, but this time I got a message that the number was out of service, which made even less sense. I looked down at my phone to make sure I had the right number, and then I looked back at Gina again. She started to say something, but her phone rang. She said her greeting and then shrugged at me, mouthed, sorry, and then she turned back and walked into the office behind the desk. I took a breath and bent down to get the bag. Oh, I nearly blew out every muscle in my body when I tried to lift it by the handle. My back felt like it strained muscles in three different places. What the hell is in this thing? Cement? I asked myself as I worked to massage the pain out of my lower back. What did Gina say was in the bag? Nothing but clothes. Well, not knowing what else to do, I notified a security guard that I was leaving the bag in the office. I walked down to the Delta Airlines hub to grab their baggage cart. They were always jackasses, as they used a different recovery service, and they usually mocked my company in the few times I'd had to deal with them. They always made me leave my ID with them, but I didn't really have a choice this time. All of the other baggage offices were closed by now. I entered Delta and eyeballed the smirking representative. With some coaxing, eventually the rep let me use the baggage cart. When I made it back to the frontier, the lights in the office were still on, but there was no sign of Gina. I readied the cart next to the bag. I braced myself to pick it up, 
using my legs this time, and I put my hand on the handle. When I pulled, I flew backwards and landed on my back, carrying the bag with me as it landed on my stomach, nearly taking the wind out of my lungs. It weighed about as much as a feather this time. I rolled onto my feet and looked around to make sure that no one saw me make an ass out of myself. And then I looked down at the suitcase. Did someone tamper with it when I was getting the baggage cut? I grabbed the handle and tried it again, this time with only a little force. Yep, it was just as light this time. I took a deep breath and closed my eyes in that moment. What happened with this bag? Am I just fatigued? I asked myself, trying to rationalize things. I rubbed my chin and grabbed the bag again, then I tossed it onto the baggage cart. As dumb as that may seem, I went out of my way to get that damn cart, so I was determined to use it. I wheeled the cart out of my Camry, and I popped the trunk, which was already weighed down by the other bags. Burning daylight now, and I had to get out on my jersey route, so I just tossed it in, and ripped the tag off to keep with the other tags. I shifted them around so that the old jet flight bag was last. Thus, it would be the last delivery on the route. I closed my trunk and grabbed the baggage cart so I could take it back to Delta. I started the Camry and drove up 95 North and over the Walt Whitman Bridge. As I drove towards Camden County, New Jersey, I noticed a smell in the air. It was a faint but a foul aroma. I chalked this up to me simply driving through New Jersey and programmed Google Maps towards the first destination on my route. The route was as scenic as it always was. With stops in Mount Laurel, Cherry Hill, Glassboro and Vineland, the office made sure that I would beat my car to death in the July humidity with as much backtracking as I usually had to do. Yep, this is the way we did things. In order of distance from the office and Time received, as opposed to some straight line during delivery. One by one, I dropped the bags off until I was left with only the jet flight bag. I programmed the street address to the destination in Tom's River into my phone's GPS and started up 295 North from where I was. It would take another hour and a half to get there, as I expected. As I passed through Trenton, I noticed the smell again and began to think about it. It had fluctuated between pungent and faint, but it never left the Camry. Not only did the smell linger, but now it was getting overbearing. I looked to each shoulder for cops, and I accelerated faster. I raced towards Tom River, so I could drop this damn bag off and call it a night. Oh, my stomach was killing me with hunger pains, but I was close to the exit for the town now, and according to the maps, I was about 30 minutes away altogether. I noticed that I was taking shallow, measured breaths at this point, that I was starting to get dizzy. To wake myself up, I slowed down to check the tag again. The name on the tag was Richard Higgins, and other than a phone number that didn't seem to work correctly, the tag showed the Tom's River address, a barcode, and an IATA number. I wish Gina would have been able to give me more information, like if Frontier had ever spoken with Gloria or if I could just leave the suitcase on the porch and wave the signature. But that was the nature of the beast with this job. Some pop-punk song from my high school days blared from the radio as it came back from a commercial break. I smiled and sang along a little bit, until I had to look at my GPS again to make sure I was still within spitting distance. I turned the radio down to plan my route in my mind. Richard! What in the goddamn hell? I screamed out, nearly swerving into a car in the lane to the right of me. Oh, the shock sent me into a panic while I tried desperately to move to the right side shoulder. It had been the sound of an elderly woman. Well, kind of. I mean, that's the best way to describe what I heard. There was something off about that voice. Something that I couldn't quite figure out while I parked on the shoulder and try to calm myself down. I thought to myself, what was that? How did it know my name? With the Camry and Park, I got out as fast as I could. Someone blared their horn at me as they nearly took my driver's side door off. 
I walked around to the front of the car to try and calm down. I stared into the back seat through the windshield, but there was nothing there except for my discarded Burger King wrappers. I opened my door again and popped the trunk, then made my way around to check the back of the car. The jet flight bag was still in the trunk. I grabbed its handle and pulled it out, half expecting to throw my back out again, but it was as lightweight as an old bag filled with pyjamas should have been. Put the bag back in, shut the trunk lid, and took a few deep breaths. Everything's fine. You're fine. You're just tired and working too hard, I told myself. If anyone needs a vacation, it's you, Rick. When I got back in my car, I noticed something good, actually. The smell was gone. But its absence, for some reason, only served to make me more paranoid than I was when I'd pulled over. I should have been able to locate that smell. Its sudden absence didn't mean that the problem was gone, and that put me on edge. Behind the wheel of the Camry, I sat in the driver's seat for a moment, hesitant to pull out into the traffic. I looked over at my phone and the GPS map on it. I was only about 15 minutes away from the location now, which gave me a little relief. I shifted into drive and merged back into the traffic. I finally wound up at my last delivery. It was 9.30 by that time, which made me curse myself in frustration. That always bothered me about people who complained I was taking too long to get to their houses with their bags. It was never my desire to drive around until 11 o'clock or midnight with their bags, just so I could end up back at my shitty apartment at 3 in the morning. Yeah, I shook my head at the thought and checked the bag tag again. 1260, Landing Way, Tom's River, New Jersey. Staring at the sign for Landing Way, I pulled my car down the street checking the numbers on the houses as I drove, so I could find 1260. I pulled close to 1256, and I noticed that there weren't any other houses on that side of the street, and about a half mile down the street there was a dead-end sign. I pulled up beside 1256 and gauged the situation. My GPS notified me that I'd arrived, but at the time I didn't think that was possible. I shifted to park and looked at what was supposed to be 1260 landing way, this is supposed to be the part of the story where I lock eyes with a cliché of some kind. Well, I figured I'd pull up to the Bates Mansion, or Hed Gein's house, or something to that effect. And I wish I could write about things like boarded-up windows, gothic editions, or someone looking at me through a curtain. Well, if I'd seen any of those things, maybe that day would make a little more sense to me now. But when I looked out of my driver's side window, there was nothing. There was no house at all. From the car, I even shone my phone's flashlight on the land to make sure I wasn't hallucinating. Don't get me wrong, it looked like there may have been a house on that land at some point. But that point was a long time ago. Certainly not that day in July. Well, there were the remnants of what looked like a driveway, not counting the tall grass that grew out of the cracks. The sidewalk kept going from 1256 to the dead end, and there was nothing out front except an old rusted fence with a gate that was maybe three feet high. Well, there was a part of that fence anyway. The fence only covered about four feet of the land in either direction. The gate hung poorly off of the hinges, what was left of it anyway. The grass was overgrown. It looked almost like a couple of odd concrete structures growing in a field. This made me scratch my head for a minute or two. I turned the flashlight on my phone off and looked at the app. I turned the overhead light on in the Camry while I gauged the situation. The GPS and app both told me that I was at the correct address. I breathed a long and deep sigh and got out of the car, leaving my keys in the ignition. I turned my flashlight back on and slowly walked towards the, well, I don't know, the driveway, I guess. I looked around using the light and made my way further onto the parcel of land. The hair on the back of my neck stood up, which didn't help the fact that I already knew something wasn't right. When I made my way up to the top of the driveway, long, cracked and worn, and being reclaimed by the earth beneath it, I looked to my right, and I was glad that I'd walked up the driveway slowly. There was a foundation to the right that resembled a basement. There were footers and columns, and a couple of old appliances that were rusted through, 
and sat down in the pit, surrounded by a few puddles of standing water. There was a washer, a dryer, and a water heater. The water heater was lying down on the ground horizontally. I then noticed a furnace nearby as well. I took a deep breath and carefully made my way back to my car. I broke into a sprint and opened the trunk. I tried the phone number on the tag again. This time, the line was not dead. It rang three times and someone picked up. I heard heavy breathing on the end of the line and alarm bells went off in my mind. I managed to stammer a weak, Hello? Hello, Richard. I heard again, and it cut through my ears and down my spine. I dropped the phone on the ground and popped the trunk open with my key. I grabbed the handle on the jet flight bag, and of course, it again felt like there were cinder blocks in the damn thing. I felt dizzy, and right away noticed that the foul odour had come back. But instead of being localised to my car, it was all around me as I tried desperately to get the bag out of the trunk. With what strength I had left in my legs, I pulled the bag out and threw it on the asphalt behind me. The latches popped open, and the contents spilled out. Like Gina had told me, all that was in there was an old nightgown and slippers. I didn't spend too long processing the contents of the bag. I just grabbed my phone off the street and made a break for the driver's side door. I noticed that the call was still going on the phone, and I shut it off. I got in the car and turned the key in the ignition. Thankfully, I was two for two against cliches, and the Camry started right up. I threw it in gear and blasted away down landing way. Within a few moments, I was back on the 295 heading south. I tried to avoid police, then I noticed that the smell was overpowering now. Why was it so bad? I mean, I ditched the bag and everything. It clogged my nostrils and made me dizzy again. As I gasped for air, it came from the back seat. Richard! Fury replaced fear as I pulled over to the shoulder and popped the trunk while my car idled. I stomped to the rear of the car and threw the trunk lid open. Sure enough, there it was, sitting in the space above the spare tyre compartment. It was the jet flight bag. The damn jet flight bag. I have no idea how, but I was still in possession of it. Oh well, I guess I was now one for three in horror cliches tonight. I yelled. I just looked to the New Jersey night sky and yelled as loud as I could. I yelled so loud that cars driving by slowed down and nearly rear-ended each other. I grabbed a handle on the jet flight bag, which of course felt like grabbing a boulder with a handle, and I pulled it to the mouth of the trunk. I was able to get it over and dump it on the side of the road. Again, the locking mechanism snapped open, and the contents of the bag poured out. There were photographs now, old photographs, some in frames and some loose prints just lying on the road. Where in the hell did the nightgown and slippers go? This didn't explain the weight fluctuation of the bag at all. Why did the damn thing feel like a boulder sometimes? I looked down at the photos. They had burn marks on them. Well, most of them did. Some were singed on the corners and some were burned beyond recognition. I picked up a few of the legible ones. Mostly, the photos were of a family. There was a husband, a wife and two kids. I'd have to estimate that the kids were ages 10 and 12, a boy and a girl, with the boy being the older one. The man wore a business suit with a fedora, and the wife, who kind of was a looker, wore a contemporary dress of the late 50s or early 60s, if I had to guess. Based on the colour tone of the photo, I guess that the pictures were taken around that time frame as well, maybe later. A few things about the photos were well, off, though. There were a few words scrawled on them in green marker from another language, except it wasn't marker, come to think of it. It was wax. Candle wax. I noticed something else in the photos, too. There was a house in every photo. It was a small brick ranch house, and the family was standing in front of it. 
The surrounding land looked exactly like Landing Way. I took a closer look at the photo. In his left arm, he held his wife. And in his right hand, it was a blue jet flight suitcase. Right there on the highway, I started looking feverishly through the other photos. One of the photos showed the man and a woman, a completely different woman, in bed, being taken through the window of a completely different house. There was another photo that showed candles on the wooden floor of a dark room. Green candles. There were five of these candles to be specific, and in the middle was a fedora and the suitcase. Well, the next photo showed the ranch house on Landing Way on fire. There were figures in the windows of this photograph. All of them had their hands on the glass. Six pairs of hands, and four of them belonged to children. I dropped the photo I was looking at when I heard my name again. It was different this time. This time the voice was deep, even guttural. I slammed the trunk shut, leaving the jet flight bag and the pictures on the street and ran to the driver's seat. I slammed my door shut, found my key and tore off the shoulder back into the traffic. I was trying to outrun the smell and this damn bag and whatever memories were attached to it. I hoped that escape was possible. The smell only became stronger as I made it to Trenton. It was then that I made the mistake of looking in the rearview mirror. I saw her eyes first. They had no detail to them. They were just these damn yellow orbs sunk into black sockets. She was old. At least she looked ancient anyway. Her hair, what was left of it, was grey and stringy. She had a grin. I think it was a grin. Her teeth were a disgusting shade of brown. She was completely nude. I don't know why I'm thinking about this now, but maybe that's why the nightgown was in the suitcase. I'm not sure what bags get inspected upon travelling down to hell. Her skin was pale white, all wrinkles but no veins. In retrospect, maybe she didn't have any blood left in her. Hell, maybe that's what she wanted from me. This time I watched her mouth open, but she didn't say my name. Frankly, I don't know what in the hell she said. Whatever she said in that moment came out backwards and deep. Yeah, her words really came out backwards, like a tape being rewound at regular speed. Sweat poured down my brow as I tried to stay on the road while keeping an eye on her in the rearview mirror. I had to swerve as a car hit the brakes in front of me suddenly, and this was a mistake. She had an opportunity she took it. All at once I found bony, cold fingers wrapped around my neck. She dug her long, dead fingernails into my jugular and squeezed and squeezed. The smell was worse than ever now as I gasped for my last bits of oxygen. I started to see trails and my vision faded out. I had one chance. I checked out of the corner of my eyes to see if there was a car to my right. The lane was empty, so I jerked the wheel with all my might in that direction. I swung the Camry over two lanes of traffic with cars honking and drivers screaming at me as the car cut. I wasn't trying to pull over, though. I jammed my foot on the gas as I barreled towards the guardrail. I cursed myself for not wearing a seatbelt as my body jerked forward and then from side to side upon impact. Glass shattered everywhere. All of the console lights in the car came on at once as the radio abruptly cut off. I felt a fire run through my spine and my leg and my arm, jolting me back into consciousness. Warm blood caressed my face, starting at my forehead and running down my cheek. But, most importantly, my neck was free from her hands. I seized the opportunity and jerked the driver's side door open, I stumbled out of the car and to the ground. I crawled past the car over to the rail itself. With my last bit of consciousness, I looked at the front of my poor Camry. The front end was crumpled in on the right side, and the headlight was completely smashed in. The windshield had shattered, and glass from the windows was all over the place. 
there was fluid leaking from the undercarriage. I then cursed myself one last time for not having collision coverage as I slipped into blackness. I awoke some time later in a hospital bed in Camden, which would definitely not have been my first choice. I was in traction with casts on my left arm and leg. I used my right hand to fill my face, which had gauze all down the right side. I let out a sigh when I realized my predicament, but then I took in a hearty breath. I'll take the smell of a hospital over the smell of death and decay any day of the week. The coming days were a mess. A New Jersey state trooper came by and presented me with a ticket for reckless driving, despite my story. There were enough witnesses at the scene to describe the lane-jumping magic act that I'd put on. I also got a bill for the impounding of my poor little Camry, and for damages done to the guardrail on impact. I think Heather texted me about the bag once. I simply texted back, I won't be delivering bags anymore. To which I never received a response, a visit, or anything else from her, for that matter. The few friends I once had never showed up or even called me to ask how I was doing. My family hates me, and I'm not even sure if they know where I live, but it kind of hurt that Heather didn't show up, or any of the other guys from the courier service. It was only me, lying in traction, alone in my thoughts. I was diagnosed with a broken femur, a fractured forearm, lower back trauma, and head trauma. I had to go through about six weeks of medication and then rehab. Well, I was only able to do about four weeks of that, thanks to my liability policy that came to around $15,000. And then they cut my cast off, and I was booted from the hospital with nothing but a pair of crutches. My leg never healed properly, and I still have a limp now. I used what money I had in the bank to take an Uber down to the airport. I picked up my last check from the bag service. When I came, Heather luckily wasn't there. No one else would talk to me, which is fine. I didn't have anything to say to them. If they weren't there for me when I went to the hospital, what was I going to tell them now? I wouldn't be able to drive again until I got to New Jersey for my reckless driving hearing. I couldn't drive for a while anyway, because I didn't have a car anymore. I doubt I'll be driving for a long time. I've been home for two months now. I saw a 90-day notice to evict slide under my door the other day. I let my phone shut off. I put everything I could into my internet and electric. I'd rather watch YouTube videos all night on my laptop, desperately trying to stay awake than talk to anyone. And who would call anyway? But at least that damn jet flight bag is gone. The smell's gone. Those damned yellow orb eyes that occupied my rearview mirror are gone. She's gone. So at least I'll figure it out again someday soon and maybe rejoin society. At least I hope she's gone. Sometimes at night I think I hear that soft, ancient voice call out my name. Richard. I tell myself it's just the wind outside. So that was a bit of a wild one, wasn't it? Yeah, poor delivery guy. Nobody thinks of the delivery people, do they? Yeah, where's my package? Where's my... Uh, whatever. Yeah, we just blame them. All they're doing is their job. And when it ends out like that, well, what a job it is. Hope nothing like that's ever happened to you. Have you done that job? If you have, then let me know about it in the uh, comment section below. What was the worst thing you ever encountered? Anything that bad? Well, I hope not. Well, that's it for me for another night, but I will be back again with you very, very soon. You're going to join me, aren't you? Of course you are. Well, until then, very, very sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin' experience, 
then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, looking forward to seeing you all again real soon. So, come check me out, okay? <laughs>